yeah, I'm just very grateful and I'm very thrilled about the reception that the film has gotten. You know, it's a very personal film and also an independent one with no major stars. I mean, of course, we have Eamon Farron, who was in Twin Peaks The Return, and Lynn, Lynn Cohen, who was in Sex in the City and The Hunger Games. But it's a subject matter that doesn't easily lend itself to becoming a blockbuster. You know, it's about an undocumented Filipina trans woman who's trying to get um, legal status in the U.S. And it's been amazing that there is a lot of interest to see it and people are receptive towards the film that, you know, especially since it touches on relevant and topical issues like immigration and the transgender experience in the U.S. So, yeah, thank yeah. you um, for making this and your film, yeah, I will start with the questions. And so your film deals with two topics that become, um, because of Trump, uh, become very newsworthy mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in the negative sense. Uh, it's immigration in general and queer immigration in particular. And of course, transgender rights um, that, um, and uh, I guess in US there is a rising uh, of violence against transgender people too. And this movie deal with uh, both of these uh, themes. Um, yes. When you decided uh, to combine, when you started to write the script, when you decided, or the idea to develop, when you decided to combine these two topics together? Yeah, so when I was, I started writing the script for Lingo Franca, this was in 2015. You know, it was more of a straightforward romantic drama about a trans woman who becomes romantically involved with a cisgender man who wasn't aware that she was transgender. And that was, that topic was very you know, close to home for me because I was also transitioning at that time. But then in late 2016, when halfway through writing the script, that was when Trump got elected to the White House. And I think like a lot of minorities living in the US, I was feeling very anxious and vulnerable about you know, what life would be like under the Trump administration. And so that was when the final premise of Lingo Franca came together and Olivia, the main character is now an undocumented trans woman who's trying to get um, legal status here in the US. And the mood and the atmosphere of Lingo Franca is essentially captures my emotional and mental state during that those first six months that Trump was president. Well, um, at what stage of the production uh, did you realize that you were um, also going to be the lead actress and the, of the film? Uh, and had you previously tried to cast a different uh, lead actress? I think for Lingo Franca, I wrote the script with me playing the lead role in mind. My second feature right before Lingo Franca was about Catholic nuns in the Philippines. So that one, I did not even want to play the role. But for this one, although it's not an autobiographical story, it's still very personal for me because I wanted to... And the character of Olivia is someone that I've lived with for pretty much close to two to three years. And it's an important film in that I wanted Lingo Franca to really reflect my vision as a storyteller, both in front of and behind the camera without any compromise. And so I was also an important political statement for the for Hollywood and the film industry here that a trans woman of color like myself can be in charge of my own narrative um, as a talent in front of and behind the camera. And I'm so, you know, just honored as well to be working with 
Ivory Aquino, who plays Trixie in the film and who is also a Filipina trans woman, although we, we come from different backgrounds and we have different situation in the film. Like I am the one paying an American man for a green card, but Trixie's experience as played by Ivory is different in that an American man is actually in love with her and is marrying her for love. So I wanted to show the diversity of the experience of Filipina trans woman living here in the US as well. And uh, uh, Ivory, do you want to say something about your experience in the movie? And Yes, hi, hi everyone, hi. shalom. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and uh, thank you for supporting our film. I want to visit Israel one day. I'm a big fan of Dan International. I hope she's watching or will watch one day. So I send you all my love. Um, yes, I, I, I feel very fortunate and just really thrilled to be part of this beautiful film by Isabel. Um, it, it, we actu I actually met Isabel when I saw a screening of the second film that she mentioned um, that she wrote about Catholic nuns, which by the way, Isabel now, now knows this, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a nun. So I, if, I was, <laughs> if I had been around during that time, I would, have I would have auditioned to be one of the nuns in that film because mm -hmm. I, I just have this dream of being a nun one day when I was a kid. Um, so yes, I met Isabel at a Q&A for her second film, Apparition, here in New York um, at the Museum of Modern Art because I, I heard that um, there was a screening and that the director was Filipina like myself and also happened to be trans like myself. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. I have never met anyone um, who was pioneering in that way in, in making their own films and writing their own films, directing their own films. So it was it was a must for me to meet Isabel. So I, I, I watched her Q&A much like this. And at the end of it, I just wanted to um, know how, how much I admired what she was doing and the film that I just saw. And essentially when, when I came up to her, she happened to recognize me um, I'm assuming from the project that I had just done a few months prior to that. And she said, let's grab lunch. And I said, oh, of course. So I was super excited to just be able to, to speak with, with someone who was in a similar situation like myself, although not entirely similar, but, but ha ha had these parallel, ha had this parallel path like myself, because I, like Isabel, um, first generation immigrant from the Philippines. Um, so we, we grabbed lunch and then um, we, we just had such a great time connecting because Isabel is not only an amazing artist, an amazing director, actress, editor, producer, but she's just an amazing human being, period. So, so I, I just wanted to be able to get to know her more. So the second time we, we um, grabbed lunch is when she shared with me that she had the script called Lingua Franca and she was interested in me having in having me be part of it. So I was I was just in in awe of that and I was extremely excited. And by the time I got home and read the script, I was even more blown away by what she had written. And as you now know, the, the film is just it's just beautifully crafted. Um, it has Isabel's undeniable voice. So Yes, I, I was I was on board after that, and um, over the months that that um, subsequently came about, we we had conversations about the character and my involvement and what I could bring to the table. And I just appreciate Isabel um, being such a collaborator and being open to to input. Um, we we both agreed that having my character Trixie be in love and marrying um, out of love with a green card following that, that it was important to show that because in the trans community, love is not, love is not exclusive to the cisgender community, to the, to the heterosexual community. Love is universal, right? It's part of, of 
very much part of the queer, queer community as well. And I think for Isabel, it was important to have that aspect in this film to show that we are not just a community that experiences trauma, but that we are a community, community that experiences a lot of joy and a lot of friendship and a lot of love. Um, so I'm just very thankful that Isabel was able to, to show that aspect um, of the queer community and the trans community in the film. So I, I wanted to ask, do you think Isabel, there, there is, you know, there is now many, there is pose that totally changed the, the world of TV with uh, lead uh, transgender characters. And uh, there is a lot of, in TV shows, there is, even in Supergirl, there is a trans actress that playing a trans superhero. And uh, so there is a change, but do you think there, there is a chance to, in the near future, to a love story between, you know, a trans woman or, or an, a, a cisgender man or a trans man to, a cisgender woman, because this is something we didn't see it in a, in a positive, even in pose, we didn't see it uh, exist yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, definitely. I think it will have to come, you know, those projects will have to be developed and created by trans filmmakers and creators. And I definitely, I'm already cooking up, you know, a project like that, that's a romantic drama that really just celebrates and embraces the love between say a trans character, you know, between trans characters or between a trans character and a cisgender character that doesn't have to be riddled by adversity, you know, or trauma or, or negativity. So I definitely have something like that in mind. That's, you know, a movie that people from various backgrounds can just watch you know, a romance between a trans and a cis character unfold and just be swept away by, you know, the romance as well. Let, let's hope it will come soon, you know. Yes. <laughs> we need some love in this world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I want to, to ask, um, uh, you know, you, you, you talk a little bit about Lynn Cohen. And yeah. when I saw that she is in the movie, you know, for me, she is like, She's this faces, she's been in so many TV shows and so many movies, and she's such an amazing, uh, she, she passed away, but she's, she's such an um, amazing uh, character, actor, actor, character. Yeah. I'm saying, yes. Um, how was it uh, working with, uh, you know, such an Hollywood veteran, you know, she is like a theatrical veteran too, you know, she is like, how was it, how she, when she got a project, what was the response? Um, did you had talk with her about that? Yeah. Um, so like this is Slingo Franca, it's, it's my third movie, but it's my first one to be shot in and produced in the US. So this is really my first time working with, you know, Hollywood, um, actress and Lynn was the very first act actress that we approached for a role in Lingua Franca and I was you know honestly quite intimidated because I know her from I grew up watching Sex in the City <laughs> yes. and I know that she's had of course an impressive um, CV as a thespian but it was through her role as Magna in Sex in the City that I became really familiar with her. And when we sent out the script to her agent and Lynn read it shortly after that, she asked to meet with me. And she told me at lunch that she really liked, you know, she loved the script and that her own parents were immigrants from Ukraine um, who came to the US at that time. That was also, you know, shortly after Trump got elected. And she said that, this story needs to be made, you know, and and your voice needs to be heard. So she is actually the first um, cast member who said yes to the film. And then we, we didn't actually shoot for at least a year after that lunch, but we would meet every two, three months just for lunch to talk more about how the script has, has evolved and how we can, 
deep in the relationship between our characters, you know, Olivia and Olga in the script. And through all of that, she has become a cherished friend, you know, and she really gives a lot of gravitas and dignity to her role as Olga. And it would not be the film that it is without Lynn Cohen's participation in it. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to talk about the layers of the character of, mm -hmm. um, of Olga and Olivia, because it looks like um, they, they are both immigrants. Yes. One is uh, losing her identity because of the damnation. And mm -hmm. Olivia is gaining her identity. Yeah. Tell me if I'm getting it wrong, but gaining as identity and becoming, you know, full person that uh, stand on her own mind. Yeah. So it's like, in a way, it's uh, they are like mirror to each other. Yes. Yes. And yeah. so I wanted, I guess you build it through the script. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me how you got the idea to create this uh, very unique um, layers and um, mirrors between yes. two, two these characters? Yeah. Um, you know, having lived in the U.S. as an immigrant for 15 years, so one thing that I really have that's close to my experience, but I don't see depicted in a lot of American films is that the U.S. and especially New York City is is comprised of generations of immigrants from different countries. And when you go outside Manhattan to the outer boroughs like Queens and Brooklyn, it's not just one heterogeneous, you know, like New York City culture. There are different subcultures that are particular to the various ethnic communities and neighborhoods. And, you know, like in Brighton Beach, which is Russian Jewish, that's only half an hour away from my neighborhood in Brooklyn, which I'm, you know, I live in Crown Heights and we are surrounded by neighborhoods. So there's a Haitian and Caribbean community. There are Orthodox Jewish um, and Hasidic Jewish communities. So these are all very unique to each other. And I also wanted to focus on, story, on the relationship between two immigrant women. And you're right in that Olivia and Olga are mirror characters who are experiencing their you know, unique types of displacement. Um, in Olivia's case, it's a lot more obvious because she is a recent immigrant and as she's, although she's asserting her identity as a trans woman, you know, after transitioning, the state is threatening to take away her personhood and her dignity by refusing to provide her a path to citizenship. Whereas in Olga's case, um, although she's already very well established as an immigrant in the US and for a number of generations, her displacement is more psychological, as you mentioned, because of her dementia, her connection um, mentally and emotionally to her history and her past is slipping away from her. Um, yeah, and so there is the final scene in Lingua Franca as a repetition of an earlier scene is it just goes to show the cyclical nation nature of you know immigration and like one someone who is a recent immigrant now might become the American citizen just a few generations afterwards and life continues to be like that here in the US where there are new generations of immigrants arriving and staking their claim as the citizens of this new home and new country. Thank you so much for the explaining us this. And um, um, I want to talk about the character of Alex. Yes. Because uh, he's like the, in a way, is the stereotype of the white man that um, 
afraid from his emotion, afraid from commitment, uh, is very raw and violent, uh, but in the same time is like looking for warmth and looking for love. And what was surprising me that is um, is open for to take to take the chance to try. Although although he was, you know, so uh, first of all, um, yeah, and it and the actor is very physical. I'm on I, I'm on a Faren is Faren. I pronounced his his, his uh, name right. Eamon Farron. I'm not sure. So it's very, it's a very physical um, acting. And and you are doing very, the opposite of it. You are very, you know, like very quiet, very um, uh, not suppressed, but very, the emotions are inside. They are not, you know, shouting. Uh, and th- so I was to work um, to create this a uh, very cre- very realistic relationship in a way uh, for very different uh, way of acting, I think, because it's very different acting. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Eamon and I, like as, as actors, we have different, I think, styles of acting. I think it worked for our different characters as for instance in Olivia's case who has been harboring you know her secrets both as an undocumented immigrant and second as a trans woman to this you know cisgender man because she does she's not sure how he would react you know he would find out about her her character is very interior like you mentioned and inward um in that we she's not the type to disclose openly or divulge how she really feels. Whereas with Eamon's character, Alex, although he is a much more physical and physically expressive actor, there is also a sense of interiority to, about him in that he's not able to first truly understand how he's feeling towards Olivia and secondly, that he does not have the freedom to openly express and manifest it towards her, given the community that he's surrounded in. And, you know, there is a lot of, there is a tendency and a cultural pressure to demonize and villainize someone like Alex, uh, but my approach to character is I think of them as products of the environments and milieu that they grow up in and the community that is part of, you know, um, the Russian neighborhood that is part of might tend to be somewhat, you know, transphobic and homophobic and less, less tolerant and accepting. And so, growing up also as someone who is male, he's not taught and socialized to really understand his his own emotions and let alone to articulate them. So he spends the his arc in the film really coming to terms with that and mustering, overcoming the fear and uncertainty and mustering the courage to, to confront them. And even though at the end of the movie, he's still, you know, not boldly declaring it. I think what's important is that someone like him is attempting to to step forward and become a better version of himself in the process. Thanks for for answer. And um... Okay, this is a question already I asked. <laughs> I have a lot of questions, and I already asked about the the the, the romantic uh, uh, the romantic drama. <laughs> uh, your absolute uh, create your own work in this movie because you are uh, the director. You are like a one woman show: director, writer, editor, 
a producer and a lead actress. Do you think this is the only way you create your own vision? And um, so this is uh, the first part of the question. The, and the second part is what is your favorite from all the, these five? What is your favorite uh, uh, part or job okay. in, all the in all these five uh, specific? Uh... Yes. <laughs> um, I think for me, it was important for me. Of course, I mean, this is not the only way for me to realize my vision as an artist by taking all these roles. Um, and in fact, the new script that I just finished, I only see myself writing and directing it and possibly editing it. I'm not going to be playing the lead um, performance. But for Lingua Franca, which is my first film after my gender transition and my first in the US, I really wanted to make a statement. and kind of make a name for myself and establish um, myself as a director. And for the most part, I'd say that, you know, my gamble and I, my gamble worked and I achieved my goal in that, you know, I got the attention of cinephiles and the film industry and the public that someone like me, you know, has the talent and the creativity to you know, make a powerful film. And second, my favorite role would have to be as the editor of the film, to be quite honest. And I, and I feel like I only took on the other roles like writing, directing, playing the lead performance is so that I can get exactly the material and the footage that I want <laughs> in the editing room to edit, to come up with a film that I want to make. Um, so it's essentially being in charge of the raw material and making sure that it's, it meets my standards of quality <laughs> as an editor, because as a filmmaker, I don't conceive of my films as words, you know, on a, in a script, yes. they come to me in terms of inspiration as, you know, scenes that I cut together to form a narrative. So if there's one role in a movie that I would never give up, it's as an editor. Okay. Um, and I want to ask, you know, what was inspirations, cinematic inspiration for the movie? Because I could, I could see so many uh, um, styles and genres Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know the genres, but like I could feel a uh, seventies Casavetes uh, so or Alice uh, don't um, doesn't live here anymore. Or and I could see in the cinematic style. Um, this is like in the way of the story and the yeah. emotions and acting. But like in the style, I could feel a, a like a more a Asian style, like um, one car wide, but much more <laughs> modest. Uh, oh, 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 yeah. Oh, a little bit, uh, um, uh, timing Liang, you know. Yeah. Um, so you know, this is when I watched the movie and I watched it a few times. This is what I got from it, but I want to hear what was your inspiration, yeah, for sure. Um, so you are very right about Wong Kar Wai, um, you know, in the delicacy and the poetry and the languid rhythm of, of the film. And like In the Mood for Love, when it was one of the most formative films for me um, as a filmmaker. And apart from Wong Kar Wai, there's also Chantal Ackerman, you know, the Belgian filmmaker. Yes. News from Home inspired the opening and closing montage of Lingua Franca, James Gray as well, who is Russian Jewish and yeah. who actually set a few of his earlier films right in Brighton Beach, including Two Lovers starring Gwyneth Paltrow and Joaquin yeah, Phoenix. There is also, yeah, definitely Casaveris as well and kind of the, in a way, the emotional rawness and visceral quality of the film. But it's so interesting because I feel like Lingua Franca is my thir third feature. It's, it's my first work where I'm not 
consciously or deliberately kind of copying or borrowing from the styles of master directors that have influenced me. But in a way, they've kind of just, these influences have buried themselves in my subconscious and they just emerge, you know, <laughs> from out of the blue. So I didn't even become conscious about the Wong Kar Wai influence until one of my friends saw a rough cut of the film and two of them said, oh, this part reminds me of In the Mood for Love. And I was like, you know what, you're so right. So, <laughs> but yeah. Oh, so, um, and I want to ask what was the most technically complex scene to shoot in the movie that you said, um, oh my God, what I got myself in. <laughs> for me, I think, you know, some people would say like the most emotionally intense scene might, might be difficult to shoot. But for me, like for instance, sorry, the, the sensual scene between Alex and Olivia or when she has a breakdown were actually the easiest for me because we're working with, I do well in very emotionally intimate scenes just between two actors. For instance, the most technically complicated scenes for me to shoot are the ones with a lot of background actors, the wide shots where you have to choreograph the movements of people who might not even have, you know, speaking lines in the script, but you're, yeah. you're supposed to create a realistic world, you know. Um, for instance, when Ivory's character and her boyfriend are at City Hall, you know, trying to arrange their wedding, that was, you know, I really needed the help of the assistant director. And also when we were shooting in the street, you know, outdoors, when the ICE agents were arresting an undocumented immigrant in the background, that was also kind of complicated, especially because you have to navigate, you know, not just your own extras, but you are shooting outside, you know, and other people yes. are watching. And what was the most emotionally, um... A complex scene for you to shoot? Um, for me, it wasn't necessarily emotionally complex as I was shooting it, but afterwards, um, the sex scene between Olivia and Alex, because I've never done a sex scene before in my life, you know, in camera. <laughs> like that was the very first time I did something like that. And I had the audacity to tell my crew that I want to shoot this in the very first day of our. <laughs> shoot. So, and when I did that, you know, when we shot the scene, even though it was maybe just two other people aside from me and Eamon in the room, I still felt very, I don't know, vulnerable and exposed because here I am, like I'm showing myself being, you know, sensual and I was showing a boob. So I was just, I felt like it was a very ambivalent feeling because I was feeling like I hashtag me to myself, but I couldn't blame anyone else because I'm the director and I was the one who wrote this, <laughs> this scene and insisted on shooting it. So for a few, I think for a few days after that, I was just feeling a little um, awkward and um, slightly traumatized, but then I used kind of that emotional energy to for the other emotionally intense scenes in the film. So the night after we shot the sex scene, we shot the emotional breakdown scene for Olivia. So I channeled <laughs> that feeling into that scene that I shot with Eamon. Yeah. And um, how was uh, Eamon's response to the situation? Did he understand that you are going these uh, feelings? Um, not necessarily, because I think similar to Olivia, I'm a very uh, introverted <laughs> person. Um, and as a director, I'm very much aware that people look to me um, and I am responsible for the morale on set. And I yeah. didn't want to, you know, put out any negative energy. We, yeah. we all had 16 days to shoot the film. Wow. So I wanted to get through it as smoothly and as efficiently as possible. Yeah. 
but after as soon as we wrapped the film, I had to like take one or two weeks off just to detox. <laughs> Emotionally. Uh, um, I really do want to say something about um, shooting your scenes in the in the movie. How was it for you? I, I, yes, thank you. I, I I had the most wonderful experience because I think um, well, in any set I feel, but really in any working environment, it really goes comes down to the people you're working with, right? And um, Isabel had had gathered um, very technically proficient people, yes, but but people who were very loving and very supportive. And as soon as I got on set, um, you know, I what one of the the producers, the other producers, Carlo Velayo was 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 there. And Carlo also happened to be Filipino. And um, there's there's this kinship that you feel with with people from your home country, especially in a for, in a foreign foreign land, right? So it really was was very warm on set. And Isabel had mentioned that she she really fostered um, a, a work environment that that was very conducive to being able to do one's best work. So as soon as I um, got on set and felt that energy, I, I really was able to inhabit Trixie, who's my character, her energy and her, 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 her joy, right? And more importantly, her, her love for her, for her friend, for Olivia, and be that, that support for Olivia, um, that, you know, that Trixie is, and also, Olivia is, is, is a support system to Trixie as well. It may not have been um, evident in the scenes that are on, on, on the film, but that's how friendships work, right? We, we are each other's pillars. So for me, um, you know, in my backstory that Olivia was there for um, not just the most wonderful times in my life, but also for the most challenging, right? Because before Trixie fell in love, um, she also was just someone trying to make a better life for herself in New York. Yes. And Olivia was there for Trixie during those times. And um, you see that now, that during the moments where Olivia really needed the support of her, fr for her friend Trixie, she was also there. So I think it's, it's the film is, is, is just so beautiful in that it has so many layers to it, right? There's there's the love story, there's the immigration story. But for me playing Trixie, it really was the friendship story that I wanted to put light on. And in the most trying of times, um, when you have those friends that you can call and surround yourself with, it, it's just such a gift. So for me, I wanted to, to showcase that in that narrative of Trixie and Olivia. Thank you, thank you. Isabel, I want to ask you, um, uh, for closing, you know, this is all the time I'm asking in the end. Uh, I have two questions that are returning to every filmmaker. Um, first of all, we've been under lockdown so so many months. Um, did you watch something that you wanted to watch for many, many years and you didn't do it? And now you, you had a little bit time and you watched it? The, the sound. <laughs> yes, sorry about that. Um, actually, back in March, I think two weeks after the lockdown happened, a few friends of mine and myself started a quarantine movie club. So every Monday, we would discuss a film that we chose to watch uh, during, you know, for the previous week. And it's now been going on for almost eight months. And one the movie that we actually watched last week and that I've been looking forward to watching was Beau Travail by Claire Denis, um, which uh, is a masterpiece and really impressed me in terms of how she uses you know image and sound in such a pure way to convey sens sensuality and repression and desire. So that was 
a movie that was a highlight for me during this pandemic to have finally watched. Nice. And uh, what what is your next project? Are you working on something that we could see in the next year or two? Yes, hopefully. Um, the title of the new film is Tropical Gothic. Uh, it's, uh, it's set in the 16th century in the Philippines during the early years of the Spanish colonial regime there. And it's about a native priestess called a Babaylan. So this native priestess pretends to be possessed by the spirit of the dead bride of her Spanish master in order to avenge her dispossession um, in their hands and in order to psychologically manipulate him. So this is my own riff on Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. Okay, wow. Wow, sound uh, fascinating. And I'm already waiting to watch it. And thank you so much. I want to thank you very, very much for being part of uh, TV Fest this year and uh, for, um, for doing uh, this movie. And, it, uh, and, and, you know, <laughs> I'm full of thanks for you. So thank you. And um, thank, thank you, Ivory, for joining us. And I wish you all the success in, in your next uh, works and uh, continue to do more uh, shows and movies. And I wish you all the best. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and there, there is another uh, very famous uh, trans artist from Israel that now live in Berlin. She was watching you, Roy Victoria. She, um, hi, Roy. Hi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she had a movie in the festival too. Hi. Hi. I hope it's okay that I'm interrupting. Of course. Oh my God. Oh, wow. Uh, no, actually, I'm, I'm, I live in Berlin. So now I'm in Berlin. And I, yeah, so I also have a, a movie, a film that I done with another creator together. And I, when I saw your movie, I was very excited to see someone that, as you said, like also taking the part of being behind the scene and in front of the scene and telling uh, her narrative. And that's, in a way, that's what I was about to ask you because what I feel right now after uh, we did this two years uh, of adventure and what was really hard for me and also very interesting is to be behind the scene and in front of the scene, but also I felt as a, as a trans person myself that I felt that this is also the way we live our life uh, mm -hmm. in some, most of the journey because we are exposing ourselves, you know, in front of the world, because yeah. as we know, I don't know about your experience, but yeah, for me, it was still years of years of, you know, showing as a performance, you know, showing, you know, the, 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 the journey in front of everyone. And sometimes I feel that I see myself from the outside and I see myself from the inside and how, how much I'm exposed to the world emotionally. And when we did the film, I felt that I'm, you know, there is like a double life. I do it in my own life and then I do it on, you know, in the film itself. Yeah, and it was not it was not really not an easy uh, experience how it was uh, for you um, because it's definitely you know it's a decision which and of course it's a beautiful movie I was really touched and I I watched it today actually and um, I'm very happy that Thank you that you did this movie yeah so thank you, I mean, thank you. Of, of course. Things. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that it res resonated with you, Roy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I feel like after a certain point, it's the onus really is on us to put ourselves and our experiences and our stories out there. Um, of course, we cannot determine how people would react to that, but at the end of the day, it's us kind of taking the reins and just declaring to the world that I'm here and I exist and this is my story. Um, and to a certain extent, at least it worked for me that that authenticity and that vulnerability 
is not something that they cannot deny and take away from you. And yeah, and I hope that Lingua Franca being received as warmly as it has inspires and empowers and emboldens other trans storytellers and members of the queer community to put themselves out there. Really, thank you. I really, really thank you for being part of uh, agree to do this Q&A and uh, it's recorded and we will put it in our YouTube that other generation could uh, watch it and other okay. people. Um, and I really, really thank you uh, from my bottom of my heart for being part of the festival. And, and uh, mm -hmm. it's a privilege that we can show it in our, uh, in our, um, the Cinematech TV or D and uh, more Israelis could discover it, not only in the festival. Awesome. But, uh, so thank, thank you very so much. much. And, and I hope we will meet in the future in, yes. uh, in a festival, physic festival, and not this weird uh, Definitely. Zoom yeah. uh, festivals. <laughs> and thank We're you, Ivory. Excited. And thank you so much for having me in Ivory. Um, we thoroughly enjoy the conversation with you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, and see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.